Steve Murphy is a retired DEA agent that worked in Colombia during Pablo's reign of terror. The popular Netflix show Narcos is loosely based on his life. He is also the co-author, along with Javier Pena, of Manhunters, How We Took Down Pablo Escobar. If you want to learn more about his time in Colombia, please check out the first podcast I did with Steve about a year ago. Although we did talk about Narcos and Colombia in this episode as well, Steve mostly talked about his new and exciting project surrounding the mysterious disappearance of a Pan Am plane in 1938. Uncovering its mysteries could have massive implications about what Japan's first real act of war was against the United States, the disappearance of Amelia Earhart, and could make it potentially the first airplane hijacking in history. It takes off and there is a documented report that when the plane was was out in the water taking off that it looked like it was tail heavy, which was a little bit unusual, but you know, it was just documented report, the plane went on. Well, when it got to the point of no return, two, two Japanese spies had secreted themselves on the back of that plane. It was so big that they could hide, nobody would find them. You said no hard questions. Can I start with this one? Am I? This could be a mistake. In my research, I, it says you were involved in some um, unidentified inside America's UFO investigation. Is that a different Steve Murphy, or is that? Yeah, that's somebody else. That's, that's a different. I was like, man, how the hell did that? <laughs> what? What a weird crossover this is. Go from one extreme to the other. Yeah, I mean, we are working. We are working on a, a, a project called the Lost Clipper, but that's not—it's uh, not UFO. It involves uh, the disappearance of 15 Americans in 1938 over in Micronesia in the South Pacific, and our theory is that uh, it's directly tied to the disappearance of Amelia Earhart in 1937 in the same area. So yes. this, April, this April, we're going back for our final trip, fifth and final trip. It'll be my second trip as the lead investigator. But uh, we're going over for 10 days. Uh, last time we took ground penetrating radar looking for the bodies of these 15 Americans. This time we're taking two cadaver dogs with us. Uh, I was going to ask you, because this was actually a part of my questions. How the hell did you get involved in this project? What? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I've got a real good friend, Guy Knopf Singer, who is a former naval intelligence officer. Um, guy helped, uh, he and his partner, Jeff Regal have helped Javier and I out. They helped us out. When we first got started. They videotaped, uh, recorded, uh, our first recording for a presentation about Pablo Escobar. And we just stuck up, struck up a friendship. They both lived in Northern Virginia. In fact, Jeff lived in the same neighborhood I lived in. We didn't even know it at the time. And, uh, they, yeah, they kind of, uh, you know, gave us the background on it, asked us if we'd be interested, Javier and I both, and, and we were. And so they made us the, ch the chief investigators, the lead investigators for this project. Now, Guy has been looking at this thing for over 20 years. I mean, you know, when he went through command of staff college, this was his thesis. And um, so we, we got interested. In, and before COVID, they were making their fourth trip over to Micronesia. The uh, If you know where Truck Lagoon is, it's the island of Chuuk. C-H-U-U-K. And Truck Lagoon is supposed to be the best wreck diving site in the world because that was uh, the Japanese Pearl Harbor. So uh, when they went over, you know, for me, life's an adventure. My wife is very uh, accommodating when I want to take these these crazy trips like this. And, and uh, you know, fortunately, we were making some decent money on the speaking circuit at the time and I could afford to do it. So I went over with them for two weeks. Um, it was just it was like going back in time over there. Um, you know, we, we had to take two boats. It took a 45 minute trip from the Island of Chuuk over to the Island of Tonawas. And that's where Admiral Yamamoto's headquarters was back, you know, prior to world war two and, uh, prior to the invasion of Pearl Harbor. And, uh, there's still remnants there, you know, where the area we're searching was right across this little dirt road, from where the Japanese hospital was. Um, there's no running water. There's no electricity on the island of Tonawas, but it's inhabited. 
And then we went up, uh, you could go up, to, go down another little road and up a hill, and there was Admiral Yamamoto's, the remains of his headquarters. It's just the footers, the foundation of the building there. The building's been blown up by the, by the Allies. But behind where his headquarters were was more mountains, and they had dug tunnels and caves back into those mountains, and that was their bomb shelter. When the, when the Allies would come over and bomb the island, they'd run in there and hide. And all that stuff's still there. So That's crazy. When you, when Untouched. You like Untouched. And, and actually, there are other caves on that island that, and this was years ago before Javier and I got involved, that uh, a storm had blown through and uncovered a hidden interest in a separate mountain on Chuuk. And a kid crawled up in there and went back in the cave and came out with a samurai sword in pristine condition. And, and, you know, of course they asked him, what did you see in there? And he said, there were all kinds of vehicles in there. There's crates, there's boxes. It looks like aircraft engines, all kinds of things that has still to this day never been explored. So, Why is that? Why would no just, one explore that? Why is uh, that? I don't know if, if they were afraid of, of cave-ins or, you know, I mean, it's very, very primitive there. It's on, on the island of Chuuk, they do have running water and electricity and all that. And it's it's much more modern than the island of Tonawas. But um, I don't know why no one has ever gone in there. I'd love to do it, although I'm I'm scared to death of the critters that might be in there, even the snakes. Oh, uh, yeah. There, you know? Can you tell us a little bit, for people that don't know, the backstory of, of the Lost Clipper, the, the first hijacking in, in aviation history? What's the significance of this, of this plane and, and the story? Very good. So... Um, back during this time, Pan Am Airways created four ocean-going aircraft. They call them the Clipper Series. One was called the Hawaiian Clipper because of where it would fly to. It would fly to San Francisco to Guam. But And these were massive aircraft. I mean, they, they, they required four engines, and they had the latest aircraft technology in the motors on those aircraft. And so they would have to island hop. So, you know, this is the 1930s during the Depression. To book a, a ticket on one of those airplanes, you had to be extremely wealthy. Um, and it was it, it was like a five or six day trip, you know, because you, you'd, you would land at these different places and you'd get off the plane and spend the night in, in a hotel or whatever the equivalent of a hotel was back then. So on on the one that where the Hawaiian Clipper disappeared, the plane landed in Hawaii, um, you know, and, and everybody got off and they, they actually stayed on board a, uh, on a, a military base there. Well, there are documentary reports where guards saw two Asian looking, they thought they were repairmen, board the aircraft at night and they just thought, well, they're there to do some maintenance work. But there's no record of those two uh, gentlemen ever getting off the airplane. Well, the next day, the passengers get back on the plane it takes off, and there is a documentary report that when the plane was was out in the water taking off, that it looked like it was tail heavy, which was a little bit unusual. But you know, it was just documentary report. The plane went on. Well, when it got to the point of no return, two two Japanese spies had secreted themselves on the back of that plane. It was so big that they could hide; and nobody'd find them unless you went looking for them. They came out with handguns. They skyjacked the plane. They forced it to land uh, what we believe is in, in Micronesia uh, or close by. They took the 15 Americans, which uh, you had passengers and you had crew, uh, took them off the plane onto the island of Tonawas, and then they flew the Hawaiian Clipper to Japan. And the reason being, and this is all our theories, is that they reverse engineered the, the engines on the Pan Am Hawaiian Clipper, and then that technology was used to build the engines that were used on the Japanese Zero fighters that eventually attacked Pearl Harbor. Okay, so man, uh, <laughs> wasn't there also money on the plane or something like that? There was like some large yeah, sum of money being. There was a businessman from New Jersey, an Asian businessman, and and here's keep in mind this is during the time of the Depression. Now, he reported right. that he was carrying $3 million in bearer notes, which uh, if, if you have the note, it's the equivalent of cash. Um, his cover story was that he was going to give that $3 million to Chiang Kai-shek because Japan was at war with China. $3 million would buy 50 American fighter planes and a year's worth of maintenance. What wow. we believe <laughs> is that the $3 million was going to be given to the Japanese as ransom to get Amelia Earhart back 
who disappeared in 1937. So, well, in 1937, you know, how many years before is that? It was or, one year. It, the Hawaiian Clipper disappeared one year. in 1938. Yeah, almost a, almost a year to the to the day. Now, where did this Japanese this uh, Asian businessman come up with three million dollars? He says that he he owned three Asian restaurants in Newark, New Jersey, across the river, you know, just across the river from New York City, and that those were donations. Now, $3 million is equivalent to over $60 million in today's currency. Do you think he could have really raised that much money in the Depression? <laughs> That's so what insane. We believe also, our theory also is that, uh, I apologize for the lights here. The No, no, no worries. No worries. Actually, now you look like you're in some sort of <laughs> some disco with, with <laughs> bad lighting. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for that. Um, no worries. What we believe is that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the, good grief, was the president <laughs> at that time. And, uh, Do you have I'm another light or? <laughs> I'm the only one in the room. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. Hopefully it'll stop here in a minute. Um, you know, if actually, not, you can unscrew one if you want. If you want you to can pause, unscrew I'll, one. I'll turn the lights off and back on to see if it. Yeah, yeah, try them. We believe that. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was uh, president of the United States at that time, gave the money, the $3 million, to the Asian businessman to try to get Amelia Earhart back. Because if you go back and research, you'll find out that Amelia Earhart was very close friends with um, Eleanor Roosevelt, FDR's wife. So we believe that's where the connection is. Now, to support that, there's a lot of different things that, that we've done research on, and, and, and some is tangible evidence. A lot of this is circumstantial. But prior to uh, Amelia Hart's travel, her around-the-world flight in 1937, there are documented records at the Eastman Kodak Corporation in upstate New York where Amelia Hart had visited Eastman Kodak to view the latest and greatest camera technology out there. When I think about it, the technology didn't exist for her to fly long distances. She had to be able to refuel along the way. So she wants her aircraft to be as light as it could possibly be. The aircraft tech or the camera technology that Eastman Kodak had back then was certainly not like we have on our phones here where we have, you know, some of the best cameras in the world right there on your cell phone. This was heavy equipment that would have had to been mounted in her plane. So why was she there looking at cameras? You know, so our theory is, that she was on a spy mission for the United States, for FDR, to find out what the Japanese fleet consisted of, you know, uh, take pictures of these remote islands where they were located, such as Tonawas and Micronesia. And if you go back and look, when she went down, the United States had stationed U.S. naval vessels and U.S. Coast Guard vessels out in the South Pacific. If she's just trying to set a around-the-world record why would you go to those links to those expenses during a depression to support her? So, you know, again, this is all circumstantial, uh, but it, it lends it lends a lot of credibility to our beliefs as to what really happened. So this was she popular. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Was she popular at that time? Was she known at that time? Like she is known today, her story. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. She was, uh, Amelia Hart was like, um, America's darling, you know, because she had the, the, the uh, she had the expertise, she had the intellect to fly airplanes around the world. She had the, uh, for lack of a better term, she had the balls to do it, you know, because this was, this was a life threatening adventure with her and Fred Noonan, her, her uh, navigator. So yeah, it, you know, she was very highly thought of. She had already broken most records and, and was continuing to do so. But we just believe that there was, uh, I don't want to say an ulterior motive, but I think that this was a secret mission on, on behalf of the United States to check up on the, the Japanese. Would it be dangerous to, for her to be in such a position? Would you, as the government, I don't know, this is just me, me and you banter having some fun here, but the government putting her in such a dangerous position for surveillance or would, would, there, no, would there be no one else, I guess, is my question, uh, to do this kind of work? Um, there would, but that would raise, I think that would raise suspicion on the part of the Japanese and maybe even the Chinese as well. So, you know, she already has this background of, of setting records of, uh, you know, just being someone who is adventuresome, 
who is somewhat of a daredevil who is willing to take the risk to, to break records. And uh, I mean, there are, there are theories. I don't have anything to support this, but that, that possibly Eleanor Roosevelt and Amelia Earhart may have had a fling with each other. And one of my lights just came back on. So yeah, that was some interesting timing on that light coming back. <laughs> it's yeah, they might have had a fling. Oh, Whoop! Good. Light comes on. <laughs> I'm not touching anything. I promise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. well, that's speculation. There's there's no evidence to support that. But um, that's why we really believe that that the U.S. government gave Amelia Earhart or gave this businessman three million dollars you know, to, to see what they could do. Now there's a lot of theories as to what really happened to Amelia. Um, we had a meeting a few years ago with, uh, some other adventurers, explorers, whatever you want to call them and researchers. And it was at a restaurant in Quantico, Virginia. And at that restaurant, they presented us with a, um, it looks like a rag, an old rag that may have blood stains on it. And it's encased in glass, and they had just gotten that back. The story behind that that rag is that when the Japanese eventually executed Amelia Earhart, that that was the blindfold she wore, and that's where the bloodstains came from. And the owner of that rag had just gotten the results back where he had sent it off for DNA testing. And the DNA testing came back inconclusive because there wasn't enough DNA on that rag to, to perform a conclusive test. So there's, there's all these theories out there and, and speculation about what's going on. Um, you know, we, we have marketed this to uh, multiple production companies, to multiple networks. Uh, I was going to say, this is a Hollywood blockbuster movie written all over it, no? I mean, I'm it sold. Is, I'm in. Well, here's the catch. Everybody says, bring us a piece of evidence I can hold in my hand. If you could do that, we will fund you. We'll make a series, blah, blah, blah. When has reality stopped Hollywood from throwing some money at a fun project? Come on. <laughs> well, we had we had one network that was on board 100%, and it made it all the way to the CEO, and he came back, and he's like, nope, not until you can put something in my hand. So, oh, it's, come on. I won't, I won't go into the different um, famous people who have said, man, if you find something, we're on board. We'll everything. <laughs> But right. everybody wants to see that 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 physical evidence first. So you're so searching for the golden movie. ticket. It is. It is. And, and now for this trip, we've actually brought on a, a new member who is a, an engineer by trade, uh, extremely intelligent, uh, very accomplished in celestial navigation. Um, he's he's done a lot of research in conjunction with his wife. And this time, we have a very very specific area that we're going to address when we first get there. Um, and we're taking, like I said, we're taking two cadaver dogs with us. Um, and these dogs have the capability of sniffing out human remains this many years. This is 80 plus years. That's insanity. That's insanity. So it's, yeah. So I'm excited. I'm really excited about this trip. You know, the fact that it is our final trip. Um, we're trying to raise funds. We, we've been produ- uh, approaching a lot of philanthropists and people like that. So far, we haven't been successful. So we're funding it ourselves. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I found out you were part of this project just through some research, and I was really excited because there's so much potential here. I mean, so much interesting stuff going on. So many historical. Is it confirmed how she uh, that she was executed by the Japanese, or is that her death is unknown? I don't know the full full story of hers. Yeah, the the uh, uh, her final death is all circumspect. There's lots of different stories, you know. Like recently, uh, a group found a plane using uh, this depth sonar where they think they found a plane at 16,000 feet under the sea that they believe might be her plane. I I don't know if that's true or not. I I think if it is, I don't think they'll find any human remains on board uh, just simply because that doesn't match with our, uh, our theories. But who's to say? I mean, you know, we don't have that tangible evidence. We just have a lot of strong supporting evidence to suggest that you know, we're on the right track here. So, uh, but you think about it, like you mentioned, if we can prove this, well, the first skyjacking in the world will be of the Hawaiian Clipper. Uh, we've got the Pan Am Foundation is on board with us. They're supporting our, our efforts here. If we can prove this, the first act of war against the United States by the Japanese will not be Pearl Harbor. 
it'll be three years earlier when they skyjacked the, the Hawaiian Clipper because there were American there were American military personnel on board that plane. That's so, insane. That know, implication is crazy. To yeah, that's what makes this whole thing exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm right. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting goosebumps just telling you about this. <laughs> this is. Uh, People are asking, they ask me, like, man, why are you going over to, an, you know, an, an, an island for 10 days with no electricity, no running water? Well, it's just life is an adventure. You know, yeah, I'm getting older, but uh, the good Lord has given me the health to, to be able to do this. I'm Believe me, I'm working out on a daily basis to get my legs in shape because it's a lot of walking. It's a lot of standing. You know, it's, it's going to be hot over there. Uh, but man, it, it must be nice to not be asked um, about narcos every minute of your existence from this point on. Maybe it's nice <laughs> to have a little, you know, something else we can talk about. <laughs> well, there's, there's so many other projects that, that Javier and I support and work on. A lot of, a lot of uh, nonprofit uh, charitable things that we do. And, and uh, it's just, I'm loving life, man. My, I'm just, man, I was going to say. My wife, <laughs> my wife gives me the, the freedom to go do what I want to do, and, and she supports me 100%. So that that's a big deal. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people that I've met have said their wives, there's no way their wives would agree to me being gone for two weeks to this other right. side of the world. Remote island, middle of nowhere. And the amount of money that, you know, I mean, the airplane ticket was over 6000 bucks. So it's. What? Uh, Holy shit. Yeah. These aren't cheap adventures, but. Uh, Ah, consider it a, a, a vacation <laughs> fund, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question I think I had was about the Amelia Earhart story. Wasn't there recently a f- new photo discovered that showed her back turned at some at some port? I don't know the full story, but I could have I could be wrong. I thought I heard something about that. There was. It's been it's been a year or two ago. Uh, it was a very grainy photograph where they thought she could be on this dock. And uh, I think that's been proven that that was within a short amount of t- time was proven to not be accurate. Just to be no, okay. a nice way of putting it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying it was a scam, but uh, it was, there goes that light again. A dead end as the light comes back from the gods. Um, <laughs> you know what? Let me unscrew that light too. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, the hunt for the lost clipper. I'm really excited to see what happens to the conclusion of that. I know you're working on a bunch of other things. One of the things I saw you're working on is how to become a mob boss, the series on Netflix. Can you tell yeah, me a little bit was, about uh, that? Yeah, sure. It was, um, it's, it's, uh, Javier and I are, are represented by United Talent Agency. So they represent us for film. Uh, scripted and unscripted events. Uh, they help us with our podcast, uh, which I do a podcast with uh, Morgan Wright. Javier's a guest on that occasionally. And that we also, United UTA Speakers is our Speakers Bureau. So we work a lot with UTA. And they're always looking for things to get us involved with. And that was one where Netflix had done the uh, Making a Bob Ball series and they save the story for Pablo Escobar. It's their last, you know, that's, uh, as our, as our agent will tell you, they're saving the best for last, you know, everybody. <laughs> right, <Pablo> right. <laughs> what keeps amazing us is how many documentaries can you keep doing on the same guy? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, right. I know we've, we've probably done more than a dozen documentaries and you know what? The outcome is always the same. Pablo dies in the end, but this one apparently was, uh, you know, Netflix is excellent at marketing. Uh, they have a, a worldwide recognized name. They have z- zillions, it seems like zillions of subscribers. Uh, and that one turned out to be extremely successful. The, the producers did an excellent job in the filming. Not that because we were on it, it's just they just did an excellent job. Um, so it's, Right, they have a good narr- narrator as well for that one. Really good narrator, Peter Dinklage. Yeah, yeah, yeah and From I Game of Thrones. It is now. Uh, Peter Dinklage, he was like a character. He was the character in Game of Thrones, uh, okay. the little guy in Game of Thrones, really f- popular voice. Oh yeah, Bob, yeah, I think yeah. He, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, and and they did an excellent job. So it's, uh, and then you know the just recently the Griselda series came out from Netflix about Griselda Blanco. Who right? I haven't seen that yet, but that looks spicy. That looks it's, very spicy. It's excellent. And, and here's the thing, the executive producer and creator of that is the same one that did Narcos, Eric Newman. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. And he's working in conjunction with a couple other people that we worked with in Narcos and just did a fantastic job. Uh, when has, what's her timeline? Because I was, I was a series of questions I also had. I don't know what her timeline is compared to Escobar's. Where were you at the time when that was happening in Miami? Yeah, I was, uh, when she first started, I was probably still in high school. <laughs> 
you know, oh, really? She, okay. She, yeah, she was. Uh, she really started coming into power in the late seventies, and then um, she had to flee the United States for a while, and then she came back in the late seventies and set up shop, and that's when she really became the formidable force that she was. Uh, where she earned the nickname Godmother and Black Widow. She got the nickname Black Widow because three of her husbands died. It makes you wonder why anybody would ever marry her after that. But uh, uh, All accidents, folks. Those are just three accidental back-to-back-to-back deaths <laughs> I've heard. Yeah, they're, they're pretty well documented. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. Yeah. But, uh, you know, she, um, I think it was in the uh, mid-80s and was when she really uh she had to relocate out to los angeles and dea was on her tail there's uh, a, a real life dea bob palumbo was one of the lead investigators and i think al singletary was was involved as well they're of course they're both retired now long retired um but the interesting thing about al singletary i don't know I, i'm giving a plug for the show i have nothing to do with it i just think that they did no. a fantastic job <laughs> plug the, away miami there was a female Miami police officers that was portrayed in the um, uh, Griselda series. Her name's June Hawkins. And she was instrument, actually instrumental in bringing down. She's a real person. Uh, she worked beside Bob Plumbo and Al Singletary at the time. And they were all married to different people at the time. Well, my understanding is 10 years after Griselda's uh, uh, investigation was over, you know, Al was single again and June was single again. And they met up somewhere in another investigation Lo and behold, in retirement, they got married, and, and they're now married to each other. So it's just it's um, uh, what do you call it, a love story? I don't know. Or I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe in luck. But uh, I think it's pretty cool that they're married to each other now and um, just good people, you know, good investigators. Uh, and they brought a successful end to that story. When did she get arrested and all that? Did, did she have anything to do with Pablo in, or were they different eras like Kobe and Jordan, you know, like? Yeah, no, they were uh, not so much with Pablo. Uh, reportedly, he made a, mis- a statement. I, I don't know if this is true or not. It might be Hollywood. But the statement that's attributed to Pablo Escobar, he said that there's only one man that I ever feared, and that and she was a woman. <laughs> or he was a woman. <laughs> or he was a woman, yeah. Jeez. But, um, she actually uh, used the Ochoa brothers. So, you know, the hierarchy of the Medellin cartel is Pablo Gonzalo Rodriguez Cacha, who was killed early on, and Carlos Slater and the Ochoa brothers. And so she, her, her, her suppliers, her source of supply for most of her cocaine was the Ochoa brothers. Now that came back to haunt her later on because she kind of screwed over them. And, and, uh, you know, when she was, when she finished her prison time in the United States, the United States deported her. She wanted to go back to her home of Medellin, Colombia. She did, and several years after she got back, she was assassinated on the street there. You know, two guys on a motorcycle came by, and that was one of the assassination techniques that that she and the Medellin cartel were famous for. But wait, wait, wait! She was deported back, but she didn't go to jail over there. She was free over there. Yeah. What? It's Colombia, man. <laughs> it's Colombia. No way. <laughs> Now, I don't know that she committed any crimes in Colombia. There is uh, indication that she murdered her first husband in Colombia, and she was involved uh, in marijuana tracking, pr- uh, trafficking prior to the cocaine trafficking in Colombia. So, but, you know, there's also statute limitations in different countries. And, you know, That's crazy. So you can, she could do whatever, how many years, I don't know how many years she did in America, but she did enough, and then she was sent back to the Colombian government where they decided to let her free? How does that? I don't. How does that work? That's some high level bureaucracy that I don't comprehend. Yeah, this was. She did. I want to say like twenty years in prison here in the United States, and I, I don't have the documents here in front of me. I, you know, I use cheat notes for everything when we're talking about these things. I didn't have this one ready. Um, she, well, and they, they're going to deport her, and they let her decide which where she wanted to de- be deported to, and she wanted to go back home, and. Uh, you know, I'm sure she still had money hidden away. I don't think that she gave up all her assets. Um, and so, when I mean, they just deported to Columbia, gave her a ticket. Did the United States notify the Colombians? I'm sure they did, but I guess they had no, either statute of limitations had run out or they didn't have enough evidence on her to prosecute her, or maybe payoffs were made. You know, I, I just simply don't know, but she went back to Columbia to Medellin and, and, uh, she lived there for several years before she was assassinated. But the whole point of that is, 
you know, these traffickers have long memories. They don't forget. Right. It's fascinating, though, that you can do 20 years in one country and be innocent and the other one and start a clean sheet and you're good to well, go. And the other thing is, you know, when, when she was coming into power herself, the machismo thing in the, in the Latino community, you know, women sometimes get treated as second class citizens. I don't agree with that. But uh, and, and as you'll see in the series, she enlists the assistance of the Marielitos that were coming out of Cuba at the time, and that became her power base. So and I don't I, I don't want to give you spoilers here. You know, I, I do want you to watch. I'll, I'll watch it. I'm in. I'm and in. It was that first week. It was a, it was the number one show on Netflix. So it's it's a really good series. They did a good job. The funny thing is, if you look at the pictures of Griselda Blanco. And the actress that played her is Sofia Vergara. She's a beautiful lady. They tried to ugly her up, but they. <laughs> you can't. It, it you can't matter. do enough work there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, they don't uh, have enough don't makeup in off. the world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take off uh, uh, Griselda's family, you know. All right, I'm just kidding, guys. That was. Uh... Yeah. Um, so did you get any exclusive access to that one since you had a little connection with the producers? Did you get, did you know about that show or? I, just, I knew it was coming out. Uh, initially there was a series that was going to come out about Griselda in which uh, Jennifer Lopez was going to play her. I mean, we used to say, you're getting all these beautiful women to play this lady who was just not that good looking, you know? So, uh, and I'm not sure if the JLo series will ever come out now that this one's come out, but uh, no, we didn't. We didn't have any inside scoop other than talking to Eric Newman. You know, he's we still stay in touch with him. I was, um, well, just I'll throw it out there. You know, you're a podcaster as, as well as us. We I've reached out to him to make an introduction to June Hawkins. We'd like to have her on our podcast game. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah and that's some of our listeners will challenge us to bring people on. Um, and the the president of our Facebook fan club, a Game of Crimes fan club. Uh, came back and said, Murph, you, this is your challenge. So, <laughs> so it looks, looks like it'll happen. It'll def. I mean, you guys can definitely do it, but I did listen to the one where you had, um, Boyd on, um, oh, yeah. the, the, yeah. the character that played you. That was a great episode. Two parts. Great. great really interesting guy. Super, super from my, from my listening experience, seems like a really nice, humble guy. Just, you know, you don't usually think of that about actors. <laughs> Well, you know, back when when we took him to the DEA Academy, and and uh, this was before his current marriage, and he's only, you know, I don't mean current marriage, he's married now. This is the first time he's ever been married, but he was actually dating uh, Elizabeth Olsen, Lizzie Olsen back then from the Marvel movie series. Um, and you always thought, wow, I mean, here you are, you came from Eastern Kentucky, you, you know, a, a coal from a coal mining family, and look who you're dating. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and his wife now. His wife now. She's a she's a model. She's as beautiful as Lizzie Olsen, I think. He deserves it. He just seems like a really nice, down to earth guy. I'm I'm rude for him and whatever he does next. Oh yeah, he's he's done fantastic. If you pull him up on the IMDb and look at him, Boyd Holbrook, he's he's got a ton of stuff behind him. He's Indiana uh, Jones, the, the Predator. Wow, yeah. Logan. Logan. Yeah, yeah, he's. Yeah, and he's currently filming a movie right now with uh, Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson. I mean, he's up there with the big boys. Yeah, he's he's. Here's uh, I don't know if you know this, Nelly, but um, so when there's a there's a three part series out called The Hatfields and McCoys with Kevin Costner. Uh, I've not heard this. In but... that. He he plays okay. in that in that series. He plays a guy referred to as Cap Hatfield, who was a real person. Now. My family background, my, my parents, my family are, is from West Virginia. My great, on my father's side, my great grandfather is John C. Hatfield. My great grandmother is Lucinda McCoy. They're the two from the Hatfield McCoy feud that married that stopped the feud between these, you know, these two families between Kentucky and West Virginia. So, you know, and, and then they, somewhere along the way that they wanted to, they were trying to get away from the stigma of the Hatfield McCoy feud. So they changed their name to Murphy. And, you know, back then you could just do whatever the heck you wanted to do. Right. So that's how we went right. with the Murphy name. So, you know, we used to tease Boyd that after Narcos came out, Hey, you played my great uncle Cap Hatfield and Hatfields and McCoys. You played me and Narcos. Who's the next Murphy family member. <laughs> <in a> movie? <laughs> he's just, he's living off of you guys, man. He's just, you know, you should be getting royalties for every one of those characters. <laughs> 
Hey, you know what? Anytime I call him or text him, he responds. Uh, if he's in country, you know, I love the guy to death. He he actually did a screenplay that he wrote himself, and it had to do a little bit with uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and you know pill trafficking. And uh, he called me, and I gave him a little advice on that. And and uh, I don't know if I advised him, but I gave him what little bit of information I had. And uh, I don't know if it ever. I don't think it ever mounted anything yet. But maybe he's holding on to it for a film festival down the road. But, uh, and didn't didn't he also have your daughters in the in the movie? Or am I mistaken? He helped you. Yeah, <laughs> so I, in, yeah. In, epi- in episode one, I mean, I'm sorry, in season one, episode ten, they show that I was kidnapped by the Cali cartel. I was never kidnapped. That's Hollywood, just to you know put the truth out there. But we happened to be in Bogota, my wife and I, and, and my two daughters. And you probably remember my daughters are both Colombian. We adopted them when they were babies down there, and they're American citizens. Yeah, now, you found them on the street, and you said, "Yeah, those ones. We'll take those ones." I believe that's the the true <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the true story, right? <laughs> yeah, not quite like that, but uh, they maintain their Colombians never give up their citizenship, so they actually have dual citizenship: right. Colombian and American. Oh, wow, that's cool. And so we happened to be there the day they were filming that scene in Bogota. And, and Boyd, you know, before we ever started Narcos, we brought him and Pedro to Northern Virginia. They all came to my house for dinner one night. Boyd spent the night in my house. My daughters took him out clubbing in Northern Virginia after we finished the thing down at, at Quantico. Um, and so they knew my daughters. You know, we got down there and, and Boyd came up with this idea and he said, you know, we got to get these girls in there. So he talked to the producer, Andres Baez, who's a super guy too. He's, he's phenomenal himself. And uh, Chris Brincato was a showrunner in season one. And Chris and I are still good friends. And so anyway, uh, he said, listen, we're going to, we're going to, you know, you got permission from Connie and I. And we said, sure. And the girls were happy. They were excited about it. And they dressed them up. And so they're just extras walking down the street. And so Boyd, as he's getting ready to pull in the garage, he stops. Now the cameraman for this scene is hiding in the back of this Ford Bronco that he's driving. And so Boyd, he was a little concerned that, you know, editors might cut the girls out. So what he did is he stops and he motions for them. He makes this hand motion for them to go ahead and walk in front of him. And they do. Well, you couldn't edit that out because why are you making this hand motion and there's nothing there, right? And so uh, that's how they got the show. It's episode 10, season one. And, And the funny thing was after that, after Narcos came out, the girls would come up to me and they're like, hey, dad, I'm in Narcos. Are you? (laughs) <laughs> smart alex <laughs> damn they got you they got you yeah so that's how that all happened that's really nice that's really sweet um i think one of the biggest uh things that was uh, most interesting things from from the first podcast we did and I, maybe you can kind of tell me why you think this is but differentiating the reality from the truth, uh, the real story from the Narcos movie, what you've based your tour, uh, tour on, what you've, you know, done speaking for. Why is it so, I guess, interesting to people to, to hear the real story? You know, we're as, as, uh, surprised as anybody. Um, I, I, I have ideas of why it is, but I don't understand. We're into, you know, here we are in 2024, this is our ninth year. We're still traveling around the world telling the true story. Um, now, the four years before COVID, we averaged 75 shows a year. I mean, we I saw Javier much more than I ever saw my wife for the four years. And we That's were, crazy. I mean, we went we went everywhere, all over Europe, went out through Asia. We're down in Australia, New Zealand. We sold out the Sydney Opera House, believe it or not. Uh, we did Northern European tours. It was just crazy what was going on all over the United States, Canada. And then COVID hit and we saw an 80% reduction in business for two years. And then when COVID calmed down, we're now doing maybe maybe 25 shows a year. Um, Most of them are private conferences, um, corporate events, things like that. But um, just in December, just, you know, here we are at the beginning of February doing this recording. And in December, we flew to Saudi Arabia, to Jeddah. And spoke at the International Book Fair over there. <laughs> I That's thought insane. I get to Saudi Arabia, so it's it's continuing. But um, the way I ask people the same thing, and and like I used to really enjoy studying civil war here in the United States. And you know, you think about history. Why do we study history to start with? Well, you want to learn from the mistakes you made so that you don't make the same mistakes again. That's the reason you study history. As much as you might hate studying history in college and high school. 
that's the, the real the reason you're supposed to do it. You know, and you see here in the United States where we're trying to destroy some of our history, it doesn't make it go away. You know, I want to know why was slavery so prevalent back during the Civil War that, I mean, it led to a war between the North and the South. So we never endure something like that here again. And the, the whole world could learn. So anyway, having put that out there, people say, well, you were interested in the Civil War. Well, people are interested. Who was this guy? How did one person become so powerful? that he offered to pay off the national debt of his country twice. How did he bring his country to their knees? How was he able to corner 80% of the cocaine market in the entire world? Who is this guy? You know, is he, is he some savant? Not really. He's just a poor kid who, uh, you know. Would do anything to, to get the money. <laughs> he, yeah, he would and, do anything. Had, yeah. had no compunction, had no guilt, no remorse at torturing people and killing people. Um, if he did what he said, you know, he would reward you. And if he didn't do what he said, he'd kill you. It, it's just, so people are just really interested to hear the true story. And that's, we make no bones about it. We don't make up stories. We just tell the truth. It's nine years. We've probably done over, I don't know, I see 300, 400. We've probably done, I would guess, close to 500 appearances. And it's the same story. People say, how do you remember it? Well, when you tell the truth, it's pretty easy. Yeah, right, right. We, I was have, gonna say. we have videos that we play. We have photographs that nobody else has access to, things, pictures we took while we were down there. And we just recently, and I mean just, we've only done maybe two presentations with these new photographs. Uh, Javier was working with, uh, I won't talk, name the company in Colombia that he was working with, but um, they gave him some photographs that had never been seen before. And it's as Pablo and his henchmen are escaping from their custom built prison in, uh, in 1993. And everybody had gone to the front gate and this one photographer thought, well, you know, I'm going to go around the back, see what I can find. And he's making his way up this mountainous trail and lo and behold, he encounters. Oh my God. So, uh, man, I would not, I'd be scared to have those photos. I'd be very scared to have those photos at the time. Well, he said we, he thought he was going to die. The story that he told uh, the, these people was that he thought Pablo was going to kill him because he's a witness. And he said, you know, they're all carrying guns. And he said, uh, he said, Pablo told him, he says, no, go ahead and take your pictures. He said, you may be getting the last pictures of me. I'm a dead man walking. You know, and then he, he lasted another 18 months. Yeah. So we just incorporated those photographs into our presentation now. So it's every time you turn around, there's something new going on, you know. Yeah, it's like looking under the, you know, the carpet and always finding something, something a little more dust, a little more dirt. <laughs> and we've, we've been offered, uh, so Pablo's son, Juan Pablo, he's on the speaking circuit also. He's traveling the world and doing what we do. And, and uh, I'm not sure what his story is. I've never heard it, but uh, his agent called our agent and wanted us to go on stage together and we won't. I mean, you have flat out. That's weird. Yeah, that's so weird. That's so yeah. weird. What he represents and what we represent are two different things. And, and we know that um, I remember the, the day his dad was killed, he picked up the phone and, and recorded. It wasn't a conversation. He just knew that the government was listening. He threatened us all. He threatened to kill us all. He was going to get us. Now, you know, I'm sure he'll say that that was a, his uh, immature juvenile heat of the moment rantings and ravings and he would apologize for it but you know the things that his dad did and and we believe that he not that he participated but he may have been present when certain things happened so we'll just never go on, we'll never go on stage with him people always talk about the things the show got wrong let's talk about for a second the things the show got right and maybe uh, some elements of the show maybe didn't show as much of because I think they did a great job of showing, maybe you could, maybe you disagree, maybe you don't, of how, how vile of a person Pablo really was. I think they have a pretty good job of that. They didn't show the uh, younger relationship aspect of him as much, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the show. You're right. You're right. Why, why so, do you think that is? Why do you, yeah. I, I think, well, see, originally that was, Narcos was going to be a two-hour movie. And then once once Eric Newman and his writers got into their research, they realized there was it would be impossible. Yeah, no way, <laughs> right? To tell that in two hours, you know. So 
Uh, and even with two seasons about Pablo Escobar, that's 20 hours, you know, that they produced. It's still, there was so much more that they still couldn't fit in. Now, if you look at his, his, his early life, you know, his, his mom was a school teacher. His dad was a dirt farmer. They grew up very poor. Um, didn't have a lot, you know, just, I mean, they may do, but he realized, I think at an early age that, um, he was fine with, with stealing, with threatening other people, uh, making money on the side. I mean, he was still in hubcaps and he was still in gravestones out of, out of cemeteries and they, they would blast the names off the, the, the stones and resell the stones. You know, I mean, it's not a, a glamorous occupation that he took, but, um, then he, he got involved with a guy named Restrepo who was selling small amounts of cocaine, just a few kilos. And I think, you know, the story is, and I believe this story, that's when Pablo realized how much money you can make from the cocaine business. And so it wasn't very long after that, that he killed Restrepo and took over his business. And, you know, when you, when you don't have those, that conscience that makes you feel bad about hurting people and killing people and that kind of thing, uh, he just continued to grow and he introduced a level of violence that, you know, Columbia was, has a very violent history. If you go back and research their history, there's even a period of time that they refer to as La Violencia, the violent time. And there were, even in, uh, I read Pablo's brother, Roberto, I read his book, which is a terrible book, but I read it anyway. And he talks about seeing men with machetes kicking doors open in these little towns during this time and, and hacking men to death. You know, so it's, they come from a violent history. Well, he took, <laughs> he raised the level of violence associated with drug traffic to a whole new level. I mean, he became the world's first narco terrorist. So <clears throat> now the other thing I like to point out too, and, and uh, his wife, uh, her nickname's Tata. She wrote a book and I read that book. Um, it's, it's better than Roberto's book. I think it was, it's more intelligible, but it comes across to me as a poor, pitiful me. Look how, how I suffered. But she admits in her book to having an abortion when she was 13 years old because Pablo got her pregnant when she was 12 and he was in his mid-20s. Now, nobody likes to put that out there. Uh, you know, the fact that he's a pedophile on top of everything else. But it's in her book. Why? You can read it. Yeah, why is that? I want Because that is, I would say, and, you know, in our society, that has probably the most vile thing uh, people think of, like some super older guy with a super young underage girl. Uh, if you're a, a parent with, with daughters, like you can't think of a more horrific thing, right? So why is that? I mean, he's done so many vile things that I guess it on his radar, it doesn't register as high. I don't, I, I'm just, I guess, curious as to why that's not mentioned as much. I, I've, I've got a feeling that that may have been more acceptable in Colombia during that time. Uh, I don't mm. know that I'm just, this is straight up cultural on my part. Right. But in, in, like you said, I've got, you know, I've got my two daughters and I now have five granddaughters and I guarantee you at, at the age of 12 or 13, if a 25 year old man comes around, somebody's going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> I don't a know. 25 year old narco terrorist, a 25 year old most wanted man on the planet is Dating your now, daughter. At that time, that... I don't think he was the most wanted. I think he was still building his reputation. Building up to it. Right. But, you know, I mean, you can read Tata's book, and it's, I think it's called Pablo and Me. And uh, Pablo was known to be a thug back at that time. I think maybe her parents were afraid of him, or I don't know. And you know what? Probably rightfully so. Yeah. Um, I have a, a few other questions. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, but I have some interesting questions that I just found randomly maybe you can help me out with. You said uh, the kind of paperwork you had to do made these cases take forever or, or do any actions <laughs> take forever. I want to know what that actually means because I think you say that a lot, but I don't actually understand what, what that entails. <laughs> well, um, to build a, a successful prosecutable case, you have to document everything, right? And so our goal in Columbia was to collect, this is the responsibility of DEA being in foreign offices, is we want to collect evidence against traffickers who are having a negative impact on the United States so we can prosecute them in the United States. Okay? Because down, down there, I had no, I mean, we had no jurisdiction to arrest anybody. We could work with the Columbia National Police. They gave us permission to carry weapons. We had diplomatic passports. But, you know, we could not do anything unilateral. 
And, you know, narco shows Javier and I run across those gun, those rooftops having gun battles by ourselves. That's all Hollywood, man. We, we were always with the Columbia National Police. You know, it's, it, we did nothing unilaterally. So, um, in DEA, we document everything. I mean, when we bring on state and local officers as task force officers, they all love them working with DEA and making the big cases. But every single one of them, if you ask them what, what the biggest challenge was, it's like, oh, my God, the paperwork in DEA is just outrageous. And uh, it, it is. I mean, we used to joke around that the Drug Enforcement Administration was going to change its name to the Drug Administration Administration because there was so much. <laughs> there was so much administration, but right? When you went to trial, I, I, I think I had about a 98.5% conviction rate. Because Jeez. everything is documented, everything is laid out in chronological order. It's done professionally. You know, I, as I moved up through the ranks, the people that worked in my enforcement groups would refer to me as the paperwork Nazi because I was a I was picky as hell on their reports. Right. You know, and I'm thinking I graduated high school in West Virginia. If I can write in coherent English, you can too. I'm not an English major, but. You know, how hard is it to put things in chronological order or spell your words correctly, use some punctuation every now and then, don't have a sentence that's four paragraphs <laughs> long, you know? Sure. Uh, I mean, just things like that. And so what would happen is a lot of places that when you prosecuted someone, the defense attorneys had no idea who I was. But when they sit down and they read your reports and it's coherent and it's professionally done and all the bases are covered, their first impression of you is, wow, this guy's got his shit together, you know? So uh, I insisted that on my, on my people that work for me. And then the funny thing is years later, as they're getting promoted up in the ranks, they said, you know what, now that I'm in your shoes, I understand why you did this because it works. So the paperwork is monumental. I mean, there's even a class in the DE Academy. Uh, it's only like an hour class, but it's going over all the different reports that you have to do in DEA. <laughs> Man, that that must be a full house on in that in that room. Excited. Oh, it, it, there's days when you know um, after Columbia, I went to um, Greensboro, North Carolina. We only had five agents for 26 counties, and and you're working your butt off. And there were maybe every couple of weeks you'd have to take one or two days just in the office and do nothing but paperwork, solid paperwork for a couple of days just to get caught up, stay ahead. So that's that does not uh, sound like an appealing job. We need to make sure that we're selling this job a bit more, Steve. I'm worried we don't have enough people in 10 well, years. When you see the recruitment videos, you won't see people sitting at their desk writing reports. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, there's no montage of a guy walking into a cubicle and sitting there for eight hours. Yeah. We used to say, if the public only knew. You're right. Uh, I think last time we talked, there was one other thing that I wanted to bring up. Maybe you've looked into it since then. Maybe you haven't. There was uh, a mercenary that was hired by the Cali cartel that was uh, that was meant to kill Escobar, a Scottish mercenary, Peter McAllisey, I want to say. When I asked you about this er, uh, the first time, you you, you weren't really uh, you didn't know too much about the case, but he was a, a mercenary who had you know former military background. Uh, Cali cartel hires him. He he brings on a crew of ten people. They go into the mountains in in Colombia. They train. They have an idea to you know perform a sting on on Paulo's uh, estate, and their helicopter crashes on the day of or day before mysteriously on a low fog or high fog day is what they say. I don't know if you know much about the story, but I'm always fascinated by that one. I feel like that one kind of goes underneath the radar. You know, um, uh, and let me just look up here the name here real quick. No worries, no worries, no rush at all. Uh, I, I found like, it uh, uh, randomly searching through this. No worries, we're no rush. My, this is why I pay editors. Um, but yeah, <laughs> his story is really interesting. I, he also has like a... Killing Pablo documentary, I believe. Um, I haven't watched it. I don't know if it's any good. It, it, it just to me, he seems like a. I don't know how to say this in a nice way, but mercenaries usually aren't good people. <laughs> so I don't have high hopes that he's telling a lot of the truth. Uh, you know, and he's probably done some questionable things in his military okay, career. So there is a. If you watched season three of Narcos. And that's about the Cali cartel. Their head of security was a guy named Jorge Salcedo. And Correct. that's a real person. Um, 
Jorge ended up being a snitch. So oh. he's written a book, and, and I can't think of his the name of his book right now. Uh, oh, it's at the that makes things very spicy. Yeah, that makes things very spicy now. And he talks about that in his book. Now, I, I haven't, I've never met Jorge. Uh, my understanding, he's still in witness protection here in the United States. Um, I do know the the two agents that worked with him, uh, Chris Feistel and Dave Mitchell, and we've interviewed them on our podcast. Um, but even they don't have access to him. Because they're, you know, the U.S. Marshal Service is very serious about the sure. protection program. But in his book, you get a more, a, a better understanding of what was going on with all that. So uh, that's all I know about that uh, mercenary. I do believe that actually happened, um, but the circumstances just, you know, it. If I remember correctly, he does. Uh, Jorge does say in his book that the uh, helicopter crashed due to the fog. And right. Plus, I think I think they had overloaded their helos. You know, I mean, there's those helicopters have a specific payload capacity, and if you overload them, you know, you can't. You're in the Andes Mountains. You can't get over these tall mountains. So I I, I do believe the story. I, I can't support it factually, but I do. Yeah, it, it, it's a fun one to just uh, you know talk about because it, you know you hire a team of skilled, basically assassins, and they crash the plane. Uh, before they even get to their target. I mean, it, you know, it's one of those, like, it's not a conspiracy, but if it was, I would, I'd be sitting up front and listening very closely to what the other side has got to say. Yeah, and I think they had, um, oh, what was it? Uh, I think that the actual mercenary himself survived the helicopter crash. and they Correct. Had to the pilot survive. died. And the... Correct. And they had to survive on the mountainside for a while before help finally got to them and they had to make their way Correct. Out. You know, we're, we're talking about the Andes Mountains. I mean, that's some talking. I've been on peaks in the Andes that were as high as 12,000 feet, and I know they go higher than that. Yes, yes. I don't know if you've seen the documentary about the Uruguayan uh, plane crash that happened. It's a really popular movie here in Spain. There, in the 1970s, I believe, there was a plane crash. Uh, I think it was from Uruguay to Chile, and it landed in the mountains. And, and it was, you know, winter time, lots of snow. And it's this tr- true story uh, of these 20 passengers that survived six weeks in these snowy mountains. And they had to resort to cannibalism. They did some, you know, hor- horrible things to survive. But they end up surviving. Like uh, 10, 10 of them survived. Wow. I think I have so, seen yeah, it I don't advertised, know if, but I haven't seen it. I forgot the name of the movie. and I, I just know it's very popular here in Spain because it's a Spanish movie. But, yeah. Um, Steve, we've done an hour, believe it or not. Um, I've asked you a lot of <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, for me, it flew by. I hope you had a good time. I did. And what I enjoy about it, you know, one is, is you make it very easy to talk, Nelly. And, and the other is these are questions that I don't normally get asked. So it's uh, most interviews we've done, you know, we keep a, we keep a running list of shows that we've done, appearances that we've done and interviews that we've done over the past, like I said, our ninth year, our list is over 14 pages long now. And we Holy do shit. all these interviews, radio, TV and podcast interviews, and you get the same questions over and over again. It's a little bit boring. <laughs> it's the same answers every time. So I like it also makes it really hard on some of the questions. I appreciate that. It also makes it really hard for me uh, as a researcher to find things you haven't been asked because I'm going through literally what feels like encyclopedias of yeah. questions people have asked you. <laughs> you know, the, you know what's funny is when I retired from DEA, you could not find me on social media. I was not on right. social media anywhere. And now, you know, just like you, I rely on social media to market the things that we do. <laughs> you're the oldest hipster I know. You're such a, you're so young oh. and <laughs> you're, you're with these young kids, social media, posting videos. <laughs> but you know, it, I'll be honest with you. It, it does not interest me at all. I do it for Mark. I do it for business purposes, to be honest with you. And sure. I get to show off my grandkids sometimes. Uh, in a weird way, I, I'm with you. I actually don't necessarily enjoy that side of it. I enjoy getting the story out uh, and having guests that are interesting and hope more people find them. But like, yeah, there's a grossness to self-promotion that I don't know why, but it's just, it doesn't feel right. It's Maybe it's like a human instinct or something that's built into our idea. It just feels wrong. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. You know, there's an old saying, if you have to toot your own horn, it's probably not worth tooting. Uh, <laughs> right. That's... People say that, that Javier and I are very humble. I, I don't feel that we are. I think, you know, I don't want to brag about, you know, 
I mean, think about it. There were a lot of people died. You know, uh, um, I think I do believe that we did a good thing. People say, well, did you and Javier really achieve anything? Do you have any positive uh, results because Pablo Escobar was killed and the Medellin cartel ceased to exist? And I answered, we answered very honestly, yeah, it did have a positive effect, which lasted probably two weeks because the Cali cartel stepped in. But right. if you look at from just from the time that Pablo escaped from his prison until the day he died, roughly 18 months, 143 Colombian national police officers were killed as a direct result of the manhunt for Pablo Escobar, not counting all the civilians that were killed by his sicarios. So if, if how many more people would have died if Pablo had to, hadn't, if he had been killed in December, 1993. So I feel like, and, and you can go back and check the statistics. You can look at in 1992 and 1993, Medellin was the murder capital of the entire world. It was the most dangerous place on the face of the earth. So what we did is we looked at the murder rate in Medellin prior to Pablo's death. And then a few months after he was killed, we looked at the murder rate in Medellin. What we found is the murder rate dropped by almost 80%. So that gives me a good feeling that, yes, we helped to save lives. Did we save lives directly? Maybe not directly, but I think we did help save some lives, especially in Colombia. When is the last time you've been to Colombia? How, how is the situation today? Like that's, I guess, I don't know if people ask you that a lot, but I'm curious. Yeah, we went back, um, let me think, the last time, we've been down there a few times, went down for the Narcos filming, then uh, there was a TV show that was going to come out called Finding Escobar's Millions. Uh, we actually went to Medellin and, and did some filming there. We were only in country two nights. Um, and there was a millions of dollars at finding P P Escobar's millions of dollars. Well, the name of the show was finding Escobar's millions. Millions of. And yeah. Okay. I, okay. And I think they only did one season. They might've done a second season. I'm not sure, but um, uh, we were there for that. And then we came down to any Cartagena. luck, <laughs> any luck no. with that. If, I guess, Oh, damn it. The rats they, got to they it didn't quicker. Find anything. They didn't find anything. And then we were in Cartagena for a private event there one time. Uh, but Colombia has changed dramatically. I was shocked at Medellin how it had changed. We we actually we had a protection detail down there because you know just sure there's still a lot of people that love Pablo Escobar. And, sure, of course. And during the daylight hours, the producers took us up into the Comuna. We took we went to the barrio Pablo Escobar. Of course, we didn't get out and walk around and do anything like that, but we drove through it and, and looked around. But I was, I was shocked at how different Medellin was. You know, it's, it's now a very progressive city. It's beautiful. Uh, the people were very accepting. I actually watched the, the Super Bowl at Hard Rock Cafe in Medellin while we were there. Wow. <laughs> Which was really cool. That's a, that's a wild twist uh, to the story. Yeah. It is. And, and actually, recently, my, my oldest daughter and her boyfriend and, and a group of people went and vacationed in Colombia. And they went spent several days in Medellin. They went to Cartagena. Uh, That's beautiful. My son has been to Cartagena and the Rosario Islands. Uh, we highly recommend visiting Colombia. It's beautiful. The people there, the honest, hardworking people there are fantastic. Um, there is a lot of violence there. It's not as bad as it used to be, but I'm, I'm reading in the papers lately that there's been a lot of gang activity down there. And, you know, you got the current president as a former FARC leader, you know, former revolutionary and, and all the things he's promising, you know, certainly didn't work out. They never do. You know, right. So I, I actually heard from a friend. So, yeah, keep going. Sorry. Keep going. I heard – no, I heard that it was – uh, are you, like he loved Colombia. He went for three months. Uh, he stayed in uh, Cali for a month, uh, Medellin for two. He actually said nothing but positive things, and he didn't even speak Spanish. So I imagine if I go there and I know a little bit of Spanish, which thank God now I do, uh, I would have a really good time. Well, that's – I tell you what, um, my oldest son that went to Cartagena and the Rosario Islands – he, his wife, and some other couples were going to go to Mexico, and I. And this was this was maybe two, three years ago, and I went through the ceiling because of all the violence that's going on in Mexico. And I told him, please, please don't don't do that, you know. And, and we discussed, and he's like, well, where would you suggest I go? And I, I said, go to Colombia. It's beautiful. And he was shocked. He's like, after everything you've been through, I can't believe you'd, you'd say go to Colombia. And I said, that's how much it's changed, you know? Right. And they went down there and just fell in love with the country. So uh, everybody that asked me about it, I tell them, go to Colombia. Go check it out, man. Cartagena has beautiful beaches. It's got the history. It's still got the old Spanish fort and the big walls that you can go up on. 
Medellin is known as the city of eternal spring. It's beautiful. The people there are nice. Bogota is a nice city. There's a lot of history in Bogota. It's just the traffic there is, is unbelievably bad. It's it's as bad as anything you've ever seen in your life. I'm not kidding. It's really? Well, I used to go to Toronto, drive to Toronto every every couple of months, so I, I don't know if it can be Toronto traffic, but you know, maybe. Oh, it, they have even <laughs> odd days based on your tag number. So no. If, <laughs> if today's an odd day, if you're if you're tagged, the last number of your license plate is an odd number, you get to drive that day. That's, That's hilarious. Hey, if it's if it maybe the system works, maybe we can bring that to LA or all these places that. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe that could be your answer. You know, you you say that you know it only changed for two weeks, but but as you know, change happens very slowly over a large period of time. It's like uh, like the index. It's like a stock fund. There's times it goes up and down, up and down. When you zoom out in the bigger picture, it's going up. It's you know, Colombia today is not what it was 30 years ago. So maybe that's something to you know definitely be proud of that you were part of a movement that said we're not going to let uh, a guy terrorize uh, a country, whether it took you a long time or whether there was a lot of bureaucracy to it. It doesn't matter. It got done eventually. And it was a message to the to the next guy that wanted to do that. Yeah. And, it's, and, and if you look here, you know, the guys, they took out the Cali cartel, then the North Valley cartel stepped up, they took them out. And then the guy, Don Berna, who turns out he was the head of Los Pepes, he became the biggest drug trafficker. He's doing 30 years in prison here in the United States. But here's the reality. Colum- today, Colombia is still the number one producing country in the world of cocaine. Right. This is a bigger problem That's, than we think it is. <laughs> it is. It, it, well, here's the problem. It's the demand. It's not the supply. If the demand would go away, the supply would go away. Right. That's that. that so actually, I did talk to. Uh, sorry to keep you uh, waiting here, maybe. No but I did talk to a Canadian journalist who who has fled Mexico. And he, he actually started, you know, doing some research and reporting on some Canadian, um, I don't want to call them cartels, but they were many gangs that were the first to start interacting with Colombian and Mexican cartels to bring cocaine into Canada. And I asked him, what's the biggest problem in this, in this growing, uh, you know, cocaine? Because I think at one point Canada was only importing maybe a couple hundred pounds of coke a month. And now he's telling me, he's like, we don't even know what the numbers are. It's probably like several metric tons a, a, a week. So I asked him, like, what's the biggest problem? And he flat out said, it's not necessarily the, I mean, it is the cartels, but it's a bigger problem. It's a society problem because cocaine is yep. in Canada, at least when I was there, when I was living there, it's made to look cool. No one thinks of the blood on the cocaine when you're doing it. No one thinks about the lives for, for you to have a fun night with your fucking friends on a Friday night or whatever. No one thinks about that. And he, and he said, like, the biggest problem is us ne- finding a way to get this out there to tell the horrific stories of what is actually n- needed for this drug to get to you. Right. Right. And it, even down to the point where they're picking the coca leaves, they're, it's forced labor. You know, right. they won't say that, but if you don't do what they tell you, they kill you. You know, they've tried, they've tried alternative growing plans in the coca leaf rate in the region where coca leaves are, are planted and you know the narcos come in and they're like no this is way too much money we're making on cocaine they'll destroy the other crops and they put coca plants back in and then they threaten the people it's just right. it's horrific and uh you know it's people ask us what the what the solution is to the drug problem you gotta i think Javier and i both agree that education is one of the most important things that you can do educate people at the very youngest age possible but also address the demand and personal responsibility. If you're making that choice, you're supporting the drug traffickers, just like you said. So you can have go have fun for a little while, um, and you're destroying all these other people's lives. And people just don't realize it. Right? They don't understand the, the horrific cost of life to to what they're consuming um, behind it. They don't they don't see it as anything besides a party drug, which is you know Agreed. far removed from the cocoa leaves <laughs> from the, where it stems from. Um, absolutely yeah steve thank you so much for your time we did an hour and ten i you know if i know you're still working on that lost clipper project when you're finished if you ever want to come back and chat some more i'll have some new questions hopefully by then <laughs> about that absolutely. project so um absolutely. what are you working just, on right now just, well, like the, yeah <clears throat> well i just um uh, i can't tell you the name of the program i got picked up on a uh a well-known tv series uh crime related that they did a little bit of a spinoff because of the actor strike 
and they did okay. some scripting. Interesting. Things. So I, I got picked up for a couple episodes of that. Should come out later this year. You're uh, in the new Bond movie, I heard. You're in the yeah. new Bond movie playing <laughs> James Bond, I believe. Uh, yeah, my I insider sources went, tell me. <laughs> wouldn't hold my breath on that one. Um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a keynote speaker at a uh, fundraiser at the end of the month that supports um, the guy actually supports different four different charities, uh, charitable groups. But I'm there with people like uh, Jason Redmond, former Navy SEAL, Lou Velozzi, retired ATF agent who has his own TV series out now on Discovery, uh, Mel Chancy, who used to be the president of the Hells Angels in Chicago, who's now a Christian. Uh, once he got out of prison, Jeez. Uh, all these studs and heroes, and I get to go hang out with these guys for three days. There's a lot of shooting events, a lot of archery, uh, get to meet a lot of cool people. Um, and it's for the right reason. It's for the right causes. I'm still supporting the DEA Educational Foundation, speaking at different events around the country here, which they they create these after school programs for high risk kids. Um, there, it's just, it keeps going and going like that. It's, uh, I think we're actually doing more free things now than we were doing paid things, but you know, you got to pay nice. forward and, and uh, yeah. life's been good to us and you got to, you got to try to help where you can. I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, I took an oath of office when I became a police officer and, and I kind of coined this little corny phrase that says just because we retired doesn't mean that our oaths expired. So, right. I'm still trying to do things that I think are beneficial to people. Um, I get a lot of hate mail. I get a lot of people want me to die and they want to cut my heads off. Really? That's what, that's to, what you, to this day, you're getting hate mail. No way. <laughs> Who's sending hate Every mail? Every week. <laughs> Every week. It's, I, I almost guarantee you, I don't know because I don't respond to it, but sure. um, I am almost guarantee you it's people who were not even alive when Pablo Escobar was in his heyday. You know, that they that's don't crazy. realize – what they're supporting when they try to support him, you know? So uh, I got one the other day that this, I think it's a lady. She's on Instagram. Uh, she sent me a, was it messaging or you know, mm -hmm. so, DM in, in, direct message? DM. There you go. Direct message. And she's, she doesn't cuss me out like most people do, but she's like, you know, you've made a life out of the death of Pablo Escobar and, you know, and, and you're, you're benefiting financially from, his death and, and just, I mean, she, she rakes me over the coals pretty good. Well, the truth is she's, tr she's telling the truth. I am benefited from you, but yeah, he's a narco right terrorist. Reason. Who cares? He's a, he's exactly. a narco. It's not, not, yeah. <laughs> it's not for the wrong reason. And now like I said, we're, yeah. doing more, we're doing more charitable work than we're doing paid work. So it's, uh, she's absolutely right, but she's wrong in her, in her background information as to, to what we're really doing. I mean, but people will make better. up their own stories in their own head and they will battle those demons. They're battling those demons with themselves more there than with you. So that's how I look exactly. at these comments. You know what? And the bottom line is I haven't lost a minute's sleep over it. Right. That's the best part. Yeah. <laughs> Sleeping like a baby. That. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's a gr great way to end it. So, thank you so much for your time. I'll leave links to the, your podcast down below, Game of Crimes. Check it out, guys. It's a really, it's a really great show. A lot of, I can see high production value. You guys are uh, have a good setup, and, and you know, I, I have listened to a few episodes. So, well, thanks again for coming on. I appreciate it. Nelly, thanks for having me back, buddy. And I look to come. I look forward to coming back the third time after we figure out this lost <laughs> adventure. Hell yeah! Let's get that to Hollywood right now. <laughs> All right.